Welcome to our program today. I'm Pastor Don Chimot. I'm the director of the Healing Rooms of Buffalo, Niagara. And it's a place where if you ever need prayer for anything, you are welcome to come at the times that we're open. We're located over at 314 West Ferry. We're open on Tuesdays during the morning and Thursdays during the evenings. You can give us a call and, and find out. But you can come at any time that we're open. There's no charge, and we would love to take time to pray with you. Well, today we have a really special program, and we'd like to share something very unique with you. So I'm going to open up with the scripture just to kind of whet your appetite a little bit. And it's only one verse, and it's out of Romans uh, chapter 11, and it's Paul speaking about uh, the Jews, and it goes like this. I asked then, has God rejected and deserted his people, the Jews? Oh, no, not at all. Remember that I myself am a Jew, a descendant of Abraham, and a member of Benjamin, family. Well, Paul talks that way because I believe even today most Christians have an understanding that God's favorite people is still the Jews. That's his favorite race, always has been since the beginning of time and will continue to be so. And the reason I'd like to share that with you today is because we have a very special guest in, in our studio today, uh, Pastor Joe Krieger, and he's written a book called A Rage to Live, and it's basically about the, about the Holocaust. And of course most of us know about that. Um, but even in today's world, we kind of tend to forget that it even happened. So I'd like to introduce you to Joe and let him share a little bit about a book that he wrote. And um, so, Joe, welcome to our studio today. It's good to have you on the show. Not, thank you. It's good to see you again. It's been a few years, but it's yeah. glad to be on the opposite side of the aisle with you. Again. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a while. My goodness, it's been a couple of years. But since that time, since last time that we had a chance to talk, you went and you've you written a book. Yes. And it's about the Holocaust. It's about the Holocaust, but not about the Holocaust in um, general terms, okay. per se. Mm -hmm. It's one man's story, the story of his family, mm -hmm. and uh, how the Holocaust affected Victor Breitberg. So okay. I'm the co-author. Okay. Victor is the subject of the book. Mm -hmm. But what we did do with it was to include uh, certain historical foundations and aspects and weave that history as background mm -hmm. into the particulars of his life yeah. for us to give the story of Victor a fuller context. Yeah. So in other words, it's just not, I'm Victor Breitberg and I'm telling you about me, me, me. This is my life, but this is also what is occurring mm -hmm. in the circumstances around my life while I'm in the midst of my own circumstances. Yeah. And so that was, was our goal, to give the specific story but yet not take it out of the big picture. Yeah, right. Per se, I, I can I read I've read the book and I, it's it's really fascinating. It, it almost appears as a novel, but in reality, it's a real story. Thank you. Yes, everything in the book is true. Yeah. There's no aspect of fiction, but um, it is. It's wonderful for you to say that because it was my goal as the co-author and, and, and the editor overall mm -hmm. and deciding the flow of the book and putting it together, that was my job. Yeah. Um, I really did want the book to read mm -hmm. more like a first person novel yeah. than just a typical autobiography or biography. So you're not the first person who has uh, <laughs> mentioned that to us and so I really feel we have accomplished our goal at least in the approach of the narrative yeah and so thank yeah. you very much yeah. for that thank you well you know for for a person like myself who's a little bit older obviously um, for, for an older generation to read this they can get a really clear picture of what happens to a person who survived this mm -hmm. um, and today's you know younger generation they have trouble kind of really relating yes you know, to the reality of what really happened. Yes. And I think the way it's written brings forth um, a perspective that most books who, that are strictly fact rather than just a narrative, um, they, they, they can actually kind of begin to relate to the reality of how a person survived that. Yes, good. I'm, again, we'd be very pleased that you could uh, pick that up from, from the reading of the book. And what you've said about the disconnect is very true. Yeah. 
I mean, we could talk about that for a long I period of time. Could, I mean, yeah. you know, there are mandated Holocaust study programs all mm -hmm. over the nation mm -hmm. today. Yeah. And as you probably remember reading later in the book, we talk about another Holocaust survivor mm -hmm. who Victor knew since yeah. the time of his liberation, Paul Gast. And yeah. he teaches in the mandated Holocaust studies in the high school and college programs in yeah. the Miami area. Yeah. But it is true, and, 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 and I can bring that up to even a much more modern day and contemporary idea as well. Um, from the number of years that um, I've worked in cross-cultural and multi-ethnic ministry in the inner city in Buffalo, mm -hmm. um, it's incredible what a disconnect there is today with young yeah. people of a certain age to what their parents or even possibly more so their grandparents suffered through the civil rights movement yeah. okay, within yeah, the Afro-American yeah. community. And to imagine that that kind of a disconnect only these few years later mm. And then to imagine how that disconnect can be there at times for a whole generation of people um, thinking back to something like the Holocaust yeah, is I'm, an amazing thing. I mean, generations have gone by since this has happened. You know, I've heard people say, well, you know, that really didn't happen. But in essence, it really did. Well, obviously. You know, yeah. and you take a guy like this that, that, that didn't get stuck just in one camp, that went to four camps. Yes. It, it speaks very highly, at least to me. Um, as, as a Christian, I understand, you know, the protection that I have of being a Christian, you know, that God's always going to be, you know, taking care of me. But mm -hmm. this guy, when, when you read this going from camp to camp, you, you get, you kind of get a perspective of God's hand upon him. Well, absolutely. And we obviously had many discussions about that. <laughs> I bet. And he's, even as I mentioned in the book a little bit, you know, Victor's honest perspective is he will tell you that he was lucky. And I would say, and Victor, from my worldview and my perspective, I'm telling you it was the providence of God. You got that right. And so, um, and, the, and you know, our relationship and um, as it was building, as we were working, you know, toward the end goal of, of finishing the book, allowed us to discuss just about anything and everything. Wow. And whether we would come to agreements on certain things or not was not the point. Yeah. The basis yeah. of our friendship was didn't matter what we agreed or disagreed on in the end, there was nothing that was going to interfere with the relationship that we mm -hmm. were building. Yeah, and again, yeah. I, I also see that as God's providence, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, and, and it's just wonderful. And so, you know, here he is today, 85 years old, as you said, having survived not just the ghetto, but mm -hmm. four camps. Yeah. It was a tremendous journey uh, for anyone to have made. And obviously, he wasn't the only one. Mm -hmm. But you, we were only we were attempting. We were only attempting to obviously write basically one man's story. I guess. I guess the other thing that piqued my interest is is the fact that most of the books are written in the Holocaust are written mm -hmm. from you know perspective of this is this is what happened as, and it's fact. But um, when I, one of the very first thoughts I had when I, when I looked at the cover and I began to read some of the content was the fact: Why would you? seek out a person who literally went to the Holocaust wow. just to write another book. It, it, isn't, it can't be just another book about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. There's a ton of them out there. Yeah. Do we need another one? Right. I mean, you have some, there was some divine purpose, I believe, right. you had in your heart to do that. Well, how it began, uh, and I tell a bit of the story in the chapter Victor and Me, mm -hmm. was uh, back in 2009, I just felt like doing some different writing other than my typical theological writing. Yeah, okay. Uh, writing I've done for articles, preparing my sermons, uh, being involved in a theological think tank group, and we present formal papers and so on. Mm -hmm. And with my theater background, and I still love the theater, and mm -hmm. um, I love plays and well-written plays and good plays, I wanted to exercise myself and just do some different kind of writing. So yeah, I got this yeah. idea to write a play, and um, I can't exactly tell you why I decided to write a play about the Holocaust, except in doing some more historical reading, um, I came across an article written by a woman in Israel who had written a, her PhD paper on humor in the Holocaust. Ooh and how essential the idea of humor, various types of humor, yeah. mm -hmm. different kinds of humor, but for some, having some aspect of humor. Nothing was funny about the Holocaust. That's for sure. But people in their circumstances, whether it was self-deprecating humor or being able to make jokes about the enemy, just sometimes gave people hope. And humor helped people survive the mm. worst of their mm -hmm. circumstances. Yeah, that's right. So as I read that paper, I said, that might be an interesting theme to run through a play. And so, um, 
not to go through the whole process, but to make the story rather short. Originally, I envisioned the play as being the story of a Holocaust survivor who becomes a borscht belt comedian in the <laughs> 50s and knows Milton Berle and Maury yeah, Amsterdam yeah, and all yeah. these people. Yeah. And as I'm doing more research, I've read a couple of the autobiographical sketches that Victor had posted at the Jewish Gen website in okay. New York City. And as I read some of his material and looked at the five major points of my fictional character, I said, Whoa. why am I trying to make up a story when here's a man, the five basic points I'm looking for, oh, there's variances in it, mm -hmm. but very similar. Mm -hmm. So I, through the Jewish Genealogical Society in New York, through um, Ronnie Seibel-Leibowitz, I was able to get a hold of Victor. He gave me a telephone call. I explained to him what I was doing. We talked on the phone for about a half an hour. Okay. He said, you have the copyright to my life. Do with it what you want. Wow. And then we began talking to each other about once a week for a while. Then eventually I said, Victor, this isn't working. We've got to have a face-to-face. -face. <laughs> so we set up a time for me in February of 2010 to go down, have our first face-to-face. -face. We started talking about the play. Uh, I started doing research through things that he had, okay. did interviews with him. And by the end of that week, as our relationship was growing, and it's chronicled in the book in that particular chapter, Victor and Me, mm -hmm. uh, Victor said, you know, one day I really would like to write a little book, even if it's just for my family, to kind of just give them my life story. I have these little mm -hmm. bits written, but to kind of put it all together. And I'm not sure that I know how to do that. And mm -hmm. I said, it's not that hard, Victor. Maybe I can help you with that. He goes, okay, so you write the play, but also now you help me write the book about my life. There you go. And that's how it began. Wow. And then over a period of time, that obviously became the priority concern. The yeah. primary work was not now the play, a little bit back for that, although I'm mm -hmm. working on it now yeah. to, to yeah, get yeah, it yeah. to completion. And the book took on a life of its own and became something more than either of us ever would have imagined it could have become. Wow. To me, there's a, there is a, a divine appointment in all this. Oh, definitely. Very definitely. Yeah. I mean, because, you know, to, to take men from two different sides of the world and just unite them for a purpose that, um, and, if, and if I understand the book correctly, it, it's really going to be primarily about the love of God. Uh, because you, you, I've see, I see God's love in this book, even though it's, it's a book with a lot of atrocities and mm -hmm. a lot of people who didn't survive a lot of people who were really badly beaten and, and, and yes. brutally killed. Yes. Um, but God's love was evident throughout the book, even even though Victor didn't perhaps understand fully how much he was really loved by God at that figure, at mm -hmm. that moment. Well, again, as I mentioned, you know, our two worldviews are slightly different. Yeah. And what he might call luck, I would definitely call God's providence. Yeah. Where he might. Um, be looking at things from one perspective and 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 understanding the difficulty mm -hmm. of uh, seeing the suffering around him, the loss of his family, the loss of others, and making a statement, which is clearly stated in the book. Yeah. God provided manna in the wilderness for Moses and the Jews. <laughs> Why didn't he provide it for us? But then I would have to look at him and say, but Victor, think about what you've said in your own words. You always had bread to eat or potatoes. Yeah, I exactly. said, God yeah. did provide in that sense the manna for you, and because he did provide it for you, no, not for everybody, not for the mm -hmm. whole nation mm -hmm. of Jews within any of the particular parts of the world at that time, mm -hmm. and we wouldn't be looking at Israel as a solidified or codified nation as we would today in yeah. former Palestine and so on. So, but I said, but he did for you, and because he did for you, look at your own two closest friends that survived with you and the others that you said you were always able to attempt to share with because you kept, though he would say it was luck, yeah. I would say yeah. it was providence, he kept giving you these jobs. Every job you worked at, there was always more food, more food. and it gave you more to share with others. Mm -hmm. So God did provide the manna for Victor and others, though no, not in the sense as you're looking historically to the great time mm -hmm. of the wanderings in the wilderness, mm -hmm. Uh, and in the days of the Old Covenant in the history of Israel, but yet, in a contemporary way, and in a smaller way, he did. Yeah. There's actually some, it's it, it kind of exciting to read some of the things that they had him doing, especially the road work, where they wouldn't tell him what he was doing with the road work, yeah. but he was literally burying ashes of right. you know, people. Right, actually who working had, in the ash fields of those who were yeah. cremated. Yeah, it yeah. tears your heart out. It does, and you know, as I read, I thought, wow, if I had to, I don't know what my reaction would have been 
at that point in time, how that would have affected my heart. Yes. To see all those people needlessly die, and I'm, you know, I'm at the very end of their life, you know, right. dealing with that. I, I, did he ever relate to how he felt during that time? Well, um, Victor is not a man that would necessarily wear his emotions on his sleeves. Yeah, okay. But he's a very sensitive man. I bet he is. And uh, I've not only come to know him as a friend, I've, I've come to love him yeah. as a friend. Okay. And in that, there are those moments when we would discuss some things mm -hmm. where, yes, the tear would come to his eye. Yeah. And you could see it very clearly and very plainly. Yeah. You know what? We're going to sidestep for just kind of a moment um, because, you know, you and I have known each other for you know, several years, even mm -hmm. though we don't get a chance to see one another very often. But there was a time that you worked for a long time for the city missions. Yes. And I'm sure those are probably really, really good days for you. Yes. And um, what I what I would like to do is, you know, for the for our audience who is watching us, I want to take us back for a moment and have a roll in of some of the times at the city mission. Sure and uh, just kind of look back at those days for a moment and then we can proceed on a little bit further with you know what's going on in your life now and proceed on with the book so sure set back relax and we're going to just drop in a roll on on you and see what's happening at the city mission <laughs> There are many ways organizations, groups, and individuals can get involved with the Buffalo City Mission and our diverse programs. One such program is the Buffalo City Mission's Church Ambassadors Program. Volunteers help educate area churches and other organizations about homelessness and poverty, and the solutions that our men's ministries, women and children's ministries, and our community outreach programs provide. Key business leaders are partnering with Buffalo City Mission to help fight homelessness in Western New York. Members of our Corporate Compassion Roundtable meet quarterly with mission staff to discuss opportunities to better meet the unique needs of homeless men, women, and children. Every year, we reach thousands of people with life-giving help. It takes a lot to sustain a ministry of our size. To do so, we rely on the generosity of individuals, churches, businesses, and civic groups who extend their support through financial contributions, material and clothing contributions, volunteer efforts, and in-kind donations. Donations of time, money, and materials by friends like you means we can reach further and do more for our community. The first and best step is to visit buffalocitymission.org where you can find more information about all of our programs and services like our annual clothing drive, our motorcycle run, our golf tournament, and many more opportunities to participate. Or you can call us at 716-854-8181 and we'll be happy to talk to you or your group or organization about how you can help. Buffalo City Mission is a mission on the move. We're here to help our community and you can help to make a difference. City Mission has been and will continue to be a place where those in need can find help. Well, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that, Roland. I also want you to know the City Mission is always open to you coming down and volunteering. And uh, if you have any um, desire to do that, believe me, they would welcome your call. So uh, keep that in mind because there are always people out there who are in desperate need, even here in Buffalo. So, Joe, let's get back and let's let's talk a little bit more about your book. Sure. Um, give me some idea. Show, the, show our guests what the book looks well, like. Here's what the book looks like. Here's a copy of it. And uh, the title is Erased to Live, Surviving the Holocaust so that <laughs> Hitler would not win. Now, the title of the book is not arbitrary. 
the title of the book actually came from two specific incidents in Victor's life, and you will find them in the story as we've written it. Surviving the Holocaust so Hitler would not win, the subtitle comes from an actual conversation that Victor had with a Polish man, a non-Jewish Polish man, after he had been at Auschwitz-Birkenau for just a couple of days, and it was after Victor had found out that immediately upon arrival at Auschwitz-Birkenau, and he was separated from his younger brother and his sister and his mother, his father having died in the ghetto in the city of Lodz prior to the um, closing of the ghetto and beginning to move people to Auschwitz, this man talked to him about losing his family as Victor when he had arrived at the camp and he informed Victor that within a matter of hours his family, his mother, his brother, and his sister had been gassed in the chambers and then cremated. And Victor was just in a state of difficulty emotionally, obviously overwrought for a couple of days and when he came out of it he spoke with this man who looked at him and said, you must survive so Hitler will not win. So that's an actual quote from someone. The upper portion of the title, A Rage to Live, is just a formulation that uh, came out of Victor's own life after a period of time, having survived a couple of the camps, uh, being en route to another one. Uh, at a time when there was a temporary escape and just realizing deep within himself that he did have, and he expressed it to others, a rage to live. And so we put the two together, and that's how we came up with the title, A Rage to Live, Surviving the Holocaust, so that Hitler would not win. Well, that's, re that's really quite a way to arrive at a title, I'm telling yes, you. Yes, it is. But you know, as, as, as Christians, you know, we understand the love of Christ because we accepted Christ in our heart, and um, sometimes it's very, very difficult to realize that God loves everybody. You know, it's really God's desire that every single person on this planet, you know, you know, be saved and accept Christ as their own personal Lord and Savior. And our desire, our rage, you know, to live mm. is for a totally different person. You know, it's it's for Jesus. Yes. And you know, I, I. I can I can understand some people reading that book and, and suddenly fall in love with Christ, and I can understand some people reading that book and saying, "Wow, this guy lived a really tough life." Yes, yes. And so I, you know, I as I read, I thought, can this really touch a Christian's heart as he reads it? Well, I don't see uh, how it couldn't. Yeah. And um, only, at least from the perspective, that um, what we sometimes forget as Christians, mm -hmm. and we should never forget, is that though by the grace of God, mm -hmm. we've been saved from our sin because mm -hmm. God has changed us. He's literally circumcised our hearts and made yeah, us new yeah. people by the, and then by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Uh, we have that wonderful change of life. It's a supernatural experience that has mm -hmm. occurred to us. Uh, but we sometimes uh, forget that even with that, we have not lost our common identification yeah, with right. every other human being that's on right. the planet mm -hmm. that's preceded us or that may come after us. Mm -hmm. We are still of the Adamic that's right. race, to put mm -hmm. it in that term. All right. Mm -hmm. And as we put in the book, there's really only one race. There's only one. The human race. That's right. There are many ethnic groups and cultural <laughs> groups. And, and so on, but there's really only one race. And that's a whole other topic and a whole other story. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> that's a whole other book that I'd written, worked on in the past that hasn't yet ever come to a completion. But the idea of that uh, is so. But sometimes as Christians, we forget that. And that's why even though the Holocaust that occurred in World War II uh, for the Jews, Holocausts are still occurring today. Genocide is still going on. Still going on. We're yeah. having war trials going on right now in The Hague. Mm -hmm because of the conflict and the massacres that occurred in Srebrenica. Yeah. And so we, we have to be very careful as believers not to distance ourselves from the rest of those who in that way are no different from us. Okay. And we should have compassion and outreach and care and it should never always just have to be prefaced with the fact that 
but we want to see people come to Christ so they will fill our churches. No. No Yet there are many that that might be their perspective and maybe the only reason why they might attempt to, quote, evangelize others. But that should not be our, our, our concern in that way. I really like your statement, and, and for those watching, you know, please get the get an understanding of the fact that regardless of what nation or what nationality you are, Jew or Gentile, um, you are God's greatest creation. You are God's most treasured possession. And that's what God's desire is, is to have intimacy with you one way or another. And as, as we close off the show, I'd like you to just take a minute, if you could, and, and just pray for those that, that are out there that have lost the reality, the intimacy that God really wants to have with us. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for your great grace and for your mercy. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the great love and kindness that you've shown us and long-suffering that you've shown us by giving your own Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of our sins. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would, uh, by the work of the Spirit and as we study the Word of God, show that compassion, love, mm-hmm. patience, long-suffering, kindness, be demonstrating that fruit of the Spirit, for it is the work of the Spirit in us, Lord God, that allows us to be who we are. May we demonstrate that love of Christ that's been shed abroad in our hearts to others. May we not forget those who are lonely, the hurting, the suffering. May we, as believers in Christ, reach out to the hurting in this world, knowing that, Heavenly Father, there are uh, survivors of other contemporary genocides living right here in western New York. They've come from eastern Europe and Asia and have suffered tremendously, Father. And what a sign it is of the wickedness of the human heart to even imagine these things continue today. But as believers in Christ, help us to demonstrate that love of Christ as we reach out to others. Reach out in a real way, in the way whereby we share our common humanity, and reach out in a way of sharing the love of Christ through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And may we do this unto your glory, in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Well, for those of you who have been with us, we are so happy that you're with us today. We pray, it's it's our honest desire in our hearts, that you realize how much God loves you, because you are his greatest creation, his most precious gift. And it's our, not only our desire, but it's God's desire that you have intimacy with him. He longs for you to be a part of not only his life, but he wants to be a part of your life. So as we close tonight, may God's immense blessings come upon each one of you in Jesus' name.